All right. We talked a little bit about this, but that gets at that idea of, of, of intervention selection. This is the functional assessment. This is where it came from, all that kind of stuff. But I'm resistant to use the term functional assessment, functional analysis in 2011. It's now 2012. The slide's obviously a year old. Got to update that. Um, in that, I think the term has a visceral reaction, and I think application of Iowata's model into schools is really difficult. Um, I think we should be using what I would call a high incidence approach. Right? A low incidence approach means we're going to do a massive amount of resources to find exactly what the function is for a child because they're biting their knuckles off. And if they're biting their knuckles off, we've got to fix it now, and it doesn't really matter if it takes five days to figure it out. Right? The stakes are high enough that we're willing to do whatever we need to do in that environment to fix the particular problem. In that environment, Iowata's model works incredibly well. The people who work and do it are incredibly well trained, and they've got real tight control over the environment. I think for most of the kids we deal with, they're going to, by definition, be multifunction kids. Actually, most of the behavioral literature is saying even real low incidence kids go from attention to escape and back and forth. But I think for most of our kids, they might be escape now. But 10 minutes from now, when the attractive female who they really like walks into the room, they're all about attention. And when she leaves, they're all about escape again, and, and back and forth, and whatever changes in the environment. And what that means is that we're going to have to have an incredibly flexible approach. We need to build functionally relevant interventions, but I don't think we should become overly dependent on saying this is an attention-seeking kid or this is an escape kid, because anybody who has a typical cognitive profile is going to have a bunch of different presentations depending on their environment. What I think we should do is a whole bunch of more of brief experimental analysis on these cases, trying them out. And if people want to add some stuff to them, if they want to subtract some stuff to them, we should be ready to do that. But then let the data decide with whatever package we come up with, whether that's actually evidence-based, whether that hits all of the needed functions of a particular child or not. I don't want to become overly trapped in an hour-long meeting trying to decide whether the kid is an attention-seeking kid. There's just not much utility to that particular presentation. It doesn't make a lot of sense uh, for the populations that we're interested in. All right. So that brings us to the framework. And this is kind of the, the, the heart of our model. Um, um, I think we have to make functional presentation make sense to normal people. And that, it, it, this can't be something that makes sense to applied behavior analyst and some school psychologist and nobody else. If this doesn't make sense to teachers, they're not going to utilize the frameworks. And I think we can make this simple enough with an even, easy enough conversational framework that, frankly, they should be able to go through this process. This is what we use now. We've got one for class-wide problems. Class-wide problems is defined by any class that has three or four kids doing a similar activity. Once you have multiple kids, and we're talking about behavior problems right now, I'll get into academic problems next. Once you have four or five kids misbehaving in the same way, you cannot do individual interventions for the kids. You have to do a class-wide intervention. I'm always going to go to something like the good behavior game or particular uh, a token economy system. Everybody's got their go-to interventions. That's fine, right? Those are the ones I tend to use. The next group is number two. The student hasn't learned the behavior. They don't know what to do, one we should talk about. Number three, inappropriate behavior removes the student from something that they don't want to do, escape. What are we almost always escaping from? Academic task demands, work, exactly. Yeah, for us, work. For them, academic task demands, same thing, right? Number four, the inappropriate behavior gets the student something. It's typically attention, but it might be getting them something else. So when we say escape something, it's not always academic work. Sometimes they don't want to be around a target peer. They could escape a social situation. It's just that the academic escape is the more typical. It's, we think it's attention. It's sometimes adult attention, sometimes peer attention. They, they might be getting paid for something. They might, I mean, who knows what they're getting? Okay, but it's typically attention. And then finally, is in my favorite one, they haven't actually had to do the behavior that way before. This is a category of generalization programming. I love this category. No, nobody else tends to care about it. So, uh, but we'll talk about it a little bit. All right, so the class-wide problems. Um, I talk about the good behavior game in this. It's one that actually has a very large randomized control trial that's been done out of uh, uh, Johns Hopkins for about 20 years. Their outcome data on the good behavior game is stunning. So they're doing this in really tough, low incidence neighborhoods. They find uh, the kids that are involved in classrooms who've been using the good behavior game have less drug use, have higher school completion. I mean, and, and you think about it, we always talk about early prevention, but early behavioral, you know, successful behavior presentations layered in at kindergarten, first grade, second grade, 
make somebody into an individual who is more likely to try out good behavior than bad behavior. And then that's reinforced subsequently by fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade teachers, particularly in environments of where you've got a lot of problematic behavior presentations. And so the outcome data they have on the good behavior game is just really some, I mean, it's, it's kind of scary stuff, just how important good classroom management strategies and training good behavior profiles in young kids are. They spend a lot of time in kindergarten, first and second grade, getting the kids into behaving good. And in those particular environments, it makes a lot of sense. Again, if I've got five or six kids in a classroom, I don't let teachers do individual interventions. I mean, they can do whatever they want to do, but I won't recommend them. You, you, they're never going to run five independent interventions. And if you've got five kids misbehaving, it's a classroom management problem. It's not an individual child problem. It doesn't make sense to blame that on the individual kids anymore. Number two, they haven't learned this behavior. This is one that gets me kind of interested. I, I, I was a problematic kindergartner. Um, I was a kindergartner who um, my kindergarten teacher in the 1970s suggested to my parents I needed to be put on medication. Um, uh, I know these days that's nothing. In the 1970s, that meant I had skills. I mean, I was I, right. I had some. I had some. Some really. I had some really uh, nice uh, skills. Um, I did okay. I had a really good first grade teacher, and, and, and it did okay. I, I wasn't particularly well behaved in, in grade school or, or uh, middle school or, or high school or college or <laughs> most of grad school. But I got a faculty job so I can be a pain in the rear for the rest of my life. It works really, really well. Um, but I remember back in, in, in uh, kindergarten and first grade, and I remember what my task demands were. I remember what the teachers wanted me to do. And I remember the, the kindergarten teacher, the goal for me in, in, in kindergarten was literally, can we get Chris to walk in the door, walk over to the cloak closet, take his moon boots off, put his coat down, sit down, and shut up for five seconds. Five seconds. And once we got five seconds, we moved him up to ten. And once it was up to ten, we move up to a minute, right? The goal at the end of the year might have been five minutes. Right? Can Chris just be quiet for five lousy minutes? I remember there were footprints on the floor. Literally, all I had to do was follow the footprints. There was a prompt right there saying moon boots and coat. I got to my seat, and I had all kinds of stuff. No academic test demands. They, they weren't crazy. They weren't trying to get me to learn in, in reading, writing, arithmetic, that kind of jazz. They were trying to just get me to sit down, be quiet, and do something. Right? They were essentially in kindergarten training me in schooling. Right, the goal of kindergarten, in fact, the definition of kindergarten is the introduction of the training into schooling. I now go into kindergartens, and I, I actually, and, and I hate to say this, I find my kindergarten teachers some of the worst ones to work with because their expectations for the kids are simply so incongruent with their current developmental levels that we're just in different lands. They want the kids to be reading. And I, I mean, I keep saying, I, I remember when I, for the first time in my life, could stand up and say my ABCs to a class. Anybody know how great it was? It was second grade. And I know this for a fact because I have a ribbon still to this day for second to last in my class. Went to Catholic school. These people were not screwing around. They had no problem with positive punishment, negative punishment, positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement. We're not playing wiffle ball. I was the second to the last. If a kid couldn't stand up and recite their ABCs by second grade right now, we've labeled them MR. Ah, maybe not MR, but certainly DD at a minimum, leading to an LD label. I've got a PhD. I, I did okay. Right? Maybe I would have ended up at Harvard if I could have read them in first grade, but there's not much evidence that suggests that that would have actually happened. Right? At some point, we've moved everything up, and the thing we got rid of in kindergarten is training these kids to do these really wickedly abnormal behaviors. Sit down, shut up, Listen to people talking about stuff you couldn't possibly care less about. Who does this for a living? You do this for two hours, and you're ready to pull your hair out, and you've got all of your stuff. You've got your iPads and your stuff, so if you go off task, you can go into a different direction. And I jump up and down for two hours like an idiot in a way a teacher could never do for six or seven hours a day. Couldn't handle it for the entire... Right. At what point did we think that these were normal, natural human behaviors to take four- and five-year-olds, move them into a school environment, and they're just going to sit and be good? Right? So then they get to first grade, and they don't really know how to raise hands. And when I say they don't know how to raise hands, 
I mean, how many of you guys wear seatbelts? <laughs> Nobody ever raised their hands. Interesting sign driving. I was driving here in Missouri and said like 675 deaths. 63% of those were without seatbelts on. And when you think of the number of the percentage of people who wear seatbelts and the, the deal, that's pretty interesting. Well, regardless. You know, you remember actually putting the seatbelt on this morning? I, it, don't nod your head and say yes. Think for a second. Do you actually remember reaching over, grabbing the seatbelt, and putting it on? What happened? Did you, have like a, did you have something in your hand? Did you have something? Was it? What? How do you remember? It's just been a big discussion about it at my house. Both of my kids have gotten really bad. About it. Okay, so something has changed, so you now focus on that. For most of us, you get in the car, and the behavior is so automatized at this point that you can't not put on that seatbelt. You sit down and you automatically do it. Have you ever gotten into a new car? And you go to try to turn it on, and it's all wrong. And you're like, well, I can't get the key in the right place, and the key's like on the dashboard or something. That's automatized behavior. Right? If you go back to the 1970s, 1980s, the goal in kindergarten was to automize group behavior, automize walking in line, automize writing hand, automize those. Have those behaviors not just learn, but so automatic, so repetitious, that kids couldn't not raise their hand. Okay? All PBIS is, not all. But the core of PBIS is a return to basic instruction with prompt and consistency across classroom environments. That's why it works. It's going back to my kindergarten, get the moon boots in there, and have the teachers agree on a common framework. Until we have that level of training, we've got to stop assuming the kids are misbehaving because they're just little pains in the rears. Tons of them are misbehaving because they don't really know the right behavior. They haven't really been trained to do the exact behavior. I like to joke with graduate students. You know, your cell phone in a class, it goes off. One faculty member just goes nuts and just freaks out and tosses somebody out of the room, just goes crazy. Other faculty members, like I, for example, my students joke, a cell phone could go off, and I'm so narcissistic, I wouldn't even notice it was happening. I'm enjoying myself so much, I don't even understand. <laughs> students are out there talking, all kinds of stuff, it doesn't bother me. We found at universities, you have to now put your expectations for cell phones on the syllabus. Because graduate students, 22-year-olds, don't have the capacity to deviate between two different faculty instructors. They don't have the capacity to be able to go from one environment to a secondary environment and notice a change in contingencies. We don't expect graduate students or undergraduates to understand the differences between two classes, but for somehow we magically think that kindergartners should do it and first graders should do it. It's okay for two teachers to have totally different behavioral expectations and totally different rule structures with no explanation, but we don't want to do that to college students. Right? We have got to have more focus on specific training, particularly with the young kids. Start here. Do not assume the kids know how to do a particular behavior that a teacher expects is just a natural human behavior. Uh, sit and watch is the, the, a really nice version of this. It provides a modeling and reinforcement system for them. Uh, this goes over PBIS. It's the whole point of PBIS. They teach it, they prompt, they remind. It ends up being effective because you provide behavioral consistency across the environment. It's a very nice whole school model. All right, moving out of do they actually need training, let's look at some of the escape. All right, escape is just a, a fabulous one, right? These are kids that are willing to do crazy stuff to get the heck out of the environment. Right? And we all have these. Right? You guys have easy escapes. You say, I've got to go to the bathroom, even if you don't have to go to the bathroom, if you want to get out of this room for a few minutes. It's an escape behavior. Right? Luckily, you don't have to go nuts to get out of this room, or we'd have a problem. All you have to do is say, I, or you don't have to say anything. You've got to go. Right? For these kids, if they want to get out of something, they've got to do something. And so they've learned that, you know something, if I toss a desk, I don't have to do that. If I say something snide to the teacher, I don't have to do that. Right? These are things I can do to get out of a particular event. Right? Now, for a long time, people have suggested, and in fact, I think a lot of books still suggest, that the number one way you deal with an escape is to do what? Remove the escape. Right? Because you're reinforcing the escape behavior by allowing them to escape the event. Okay? We understand what happens when we remove escape opportunities. This is one of the few things in psychology we truly understand, frankly, because there's a line of research done on it well before IRBs existed. Anybody know what this research is? When you stick dogs into the boxes where they can go from one room to the other, one part of the cage to the other, and you shock one side of it, right? And they go to the other side, they escape. 
and you pop a light on and they'll run right to the other side and then they put a barrier in so they can't escape and they shock the dog and they shock the dog and they shock the dog and they shock him and they shock him shock him what does the dog do lays down until what until they go to take the dog out of the cage until they actually go to pick the dog up and some of the dogs aggress because now we've got a change in contingency and they've got an option and they can aggress out. Some of them do nothing, pick them up and they just lay there. Other ones just go nuts. Does this sound familiar? At all familiar? So you give me, I don't know, a third grade kid who isn't reading at grade level. And then we force him to do group reading activities, basically documenting to all of his or her peers that they're stupid. We want to use nice words, intellectual disability, learning disability, development and delay. Kids, a little bit more colorful, right? Retarded, dumb, can't read. And so we have them read. We shock them, and we shock them, and we shock them, and we shock them. And the kid just sits there until they don't. Then they aggress out. If a kid is willing to engage in escape behaviors, the stupidest thing we can ever ask teachers to do is ride out ride out the extinction burst. You know what teachers never do? Ride out the extinction burst. You know what none of us ever does? Ride out the extinction burst. The kid who is willing to do something that already gets them kicked out. What is that child going to be willing to do when you trap them and they've got to change the intensity, the topography, and the frequency of the behavior that had been previously reinforcing? Who the heck knows? But it's not going to be something the teacher's going to ride out. How do we get rid of the escape behavior with the kid who is willing to get out of the environment when we're giving them a task demand that they can't do. Put a book in front of them that they can read. Right? We're going to get back to this on the academic side. But you have to do an antecedent modification. You've got to change the stimuli that was promoting the escape. Right? Uh, this is one of the more convoluted briefs we have on the site. And, and fortunately, my two favorite briefs on the site are non-contingent reinforcement and this idea of, of, and we'll talk about non-contingent reinforcement, and the idea of class-wide antecedent modifications. There's actually a wonderful series of class-wide antecedent modifications that you can do. Some of it involves choice. Some of it involves pairing up with peers so that they have support so that they can do the activity. Some of it has, involves just put them in an appropriate instructional match. But if you don't fix that, you can't fix the escape. And I think escape-type situations are functions of which we can really have conversations with teachers and schools about, look, our 2012 model of fifth grade kids always got to stay in fifth grade classes no matter what happens, that doesn't work. It didn't work in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s of where we would have taken that kid and put them in a third grade classroom to learn reading. That was fine. This idea that kids are happier being with their same age peers versus peers that are at their current academic level is just silly. They would much prefer to be academically successful rather than being embarrassed in front of the people that they go to go on the playground with. The antecedent modifications brief, I think, is a pretty neat version to get to that. Uh, they get something, attention. I put response cost raffle here, but uh, these are kids that I, <laughs> I always joke with this one. Uh, anybody watch Dr. Phil? Yeah, I, I, I got to admit, I'm not a fan. But uh, he, he's got this kind of snide remark that he, say, he says, how's that, I can't even do it anymore. How's that working for you? Right? And he says it in this like, oh, you're, you know, you're dressing in women's lingerie. How's that working for you? And I'm looking at the TV screaming, it's working fine because he's doing it. I mean, it's got to be working for him or he wouldn't be doing it, right? Of course, he's on the Dr. Phil show, so I mean, something's not working, but regardless. And he says it in this snide way, like once he says that, they're going to be like, holy crap, that was a bad idea. I got to put on some boxers. That's going to be much more effective. Right? What I always thought was funny about that is the question really should be, how exactly is that working for you? Like, explain, what, like, what exactly are you getting? No snideness, no condescension, none of that. Just, just like, what exactly are you getting? And can we possibly give you something different that's going to look a little bit better with your marriage or for whatever reason you're in this situation? Or, you know, just don't let people know or whatever. Right? Can we make this so that it doesn't impact your actual day-to-day -day living? Okay. With attention-seeking kids, it's the same idea, right? These are kids who are willing to misbehave because they're fine with crappy attention, right? They're little fish tanks, half empty. They'll take dirty water. They want something. 
So we've just simply got to find a method to give them something cleaner. Now, I push response cost raffle because it, it's, it's got some cool uh, features to it. But I really, non-contingent reinforcement is, is the thing we push in every one of these situations as a starter. And that's the deal of where we just get the teacher to, you know, five, ten times right at the beginning of the, uh, of the class, reinforce the kid, just pause the praise statement, touch on the shoulder, anything, whatever's going to work for that particular kid, just for not being bad. Random attention, random attention. And the teachers always want to get into, oh, the parents are getting divorced, mom's an alcoholic, brother was like the blah, blah, oh, Stop, stop, whatever. If anything, any of those situations would lead a kid to be more attention-seeking in the environment, use it. All right, so I've got teachers with little Post-it notepads where they put little smiley face stickers on every single one of them and just go over and slap a couple on the kid's desk. Young kids, not middle school. It doesn't work so well for middle school kids. Right? For middle school kids, it might just be a little head nod. Okay? Or we've got ones of where we put them next to a high-status peer and have the peer give them a little tap on the shoulders. Right? Peer attention. If you can inundate them with attention, inundate them with attention, then it takes the edge off of their attention-seeking needs, and then that makes things like response cost raffles more effective. You'll notice a trend here, by the way. All of the interventions I tend to like on the behavioral side are antecedent interventions. I don't like reacting to child misbehavior. When they start reacting to child misbehavior, you got problems. you got to fix the reason of the misbehavior. So um, if anybody can come up with a really nice name for non-contingent reinforcement, um, I'm willing to change the name of the brief. I think a lot of people don't use that brief because they look at it and they, they say, particularly teachers say, ooh, that's complicated. Big words, right? And, and we need to put something like, catch them while they're good or some stupid, check in, check out, you know, something, you know, goofy that gets people, sit and watch, something that gets them jazzy and simple. But regardless, I think that's the, the best approach with them. Um, I, I don't have slides on the generalization programming ones. Most of our generalization program interventions get to the idea that once you learn a task in one setting, we assume that people naturally generalize it to a secondary setting. Uh, we actually do this with reading. You read fluently, we assume you do comprehension. Um, in that instance, most kids do, but the kids that don't need generalization prompts. Um, we do social skills training in a closed room, and then we expect that they apply that on the playground. Um, there are specific ways. There are Stokes and Bear and Stokes and Onus back in the 1970s and 1980s designed a wonderful model for generalization programming. So, for example, having prompts that exist in the training setting out on the, you know, out on the playground. We've got a bunch of stuff like that. The reason I don't talk about it much is because those briefs almost never get hit. Essentially, if a child can exhibit the primary skill, they're not an intervention problem anymore. Um, they might be maximalized by some, some generalization programming, but there's other cases of where the kid's throwing a desk, and so people, people deal with those. Um, on the academic side of this, and this is the Daily Witt, Martens, and Dual model um, back from uh, 1990. I think this is one of the real critical school psych uh, advancements uh, put out there. It's based on some of the old instructional hierarchy ideology. I just loved how simple they made this. Uh, kid doesn't want to do it. They haven't spent enough time doing it. They haven't had enough help doing it. Uh, they haven't had to do it that way before, or it's just too hard. Uh, usually when I present this stuff to teachers, I actually start with the academic stuff because this makes a ton of sense to teachers. And when they buy into the academic side, it's easy to get them to buy into the behavioral side. And the behavioral stuff really doesn't make a lot of sense to teachers. They haven't had as much training, exposure, and confidence in that. I mean, a really good special ed teacher who takes care of all these kids gets it, but we never actually work with that teacher because she takes care of all the kids and there's you know, no point working with them. Um, I usually, and, and I, I, this slide for some reason I flipped, I, I, they don't wanna do it, really should be at the bottom. Because very rarely to kids, they've got to have a long history of failure for kids to be able to do the academic task demand and then just to say, ah, I don't, I don't feel like doing it. In most instances, it's easier just to do the task demand than it is not to if you're fluent with those particular activities. Uh, if we do, and, and I'll, I even flip this in the presentation, frankly, if it's, they don't want to do it, we need to put them over on the behavioral side and make it less punishing, more reinforcing, treat it as a behavioral issue, not as an academic issue. Um, they haven't spent enough time doing it. This is a fluency issue, right? Anybody here uh, w was a swimmer? Anybody like, a swimmer? So, so what did you, like, it, kind of an interesting gig, right? So they taught you the strokes, and it took, may, it took you maybe, you know, a month, two months to learn the strokes. And then what did you do for the next 27 years? Doing what? And when you were done practicing, what did you do? And then what did you do after you, that? And then after that you did? Okay, so you learned it, and then you spent years doing it over and over and over and over and over again. I said, this is interesting. This is, this is very novel. Okay. 
Now let's look at the American school system. Okay? A kid exhibits the capacity to read a word. Do we spend the rest of the year having them practice in that same curricular level? What do we do? Oh, we move them to the next level, right? And if they're like Doogie Hauser smart, going back to TV, medical doctors, we have them skip a few grades because there's no real benefit to actually doing repetitious behavior if we want to get really good at something that might be mildly important, like, I don't know, reading or writing or, or basic mathematics or behavior. Right. We've got a whole nation of kids where the goal of the American educational system is to move them up as fast as possible. And what this has resulted in is essentially a bimodal distribution of kids who either are bright enough that they become high-level, air-filled readers. That's called the American college student. Right? They read with 3% air rates. It frustrates the hell out of them, but they were smart enough to get through the basic material in high school. Graduate students, smart enough to get through the basic material undergrad. But there's real frustration when they then pick up school psych review because they haven't become a truly proficient reader. And the people who never spent enough time to ever get accurate at it, we'll talk about them next. The intervention for these kids is practice. And then after you're done practicing, practice more. And then after you're done with that, go ahead and practice some more. Right? I'm going to suggest something like partner reading, because when we do partner reading, that's going to be really good with the accuracy kids. Right? It's going to end up being effective for this population, because they're going to practice in material that's under their current skill level, but probably where they're actually only 96, 97, 98 percent accurate, and their actual reading speed isn't as high as one would really likely expect. Okay? We need far more repetition for kids in American schools if we want them to become truly automatic. How many of you have, you have younger kids not using their seatbelts? They're not that young, no. They just recently both started. 16. 16, 17. 16 oh, 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 so in the back, okay. Um, and you know what the death years are in driving? I mean, it's, it's, this is, what are the death years in driving? Yeah. The insurance companies call them the death years. It's first driver, okay? It's actually the first three years of driving. And so if, if the state lets you start at 16, it's when you're 16, 17, 18. If, if, the, if, if for some reason you start driving when you're 21, it's 21, 22, 23. Why is that? It's, this is a wickedly hard thing to do, okay? You guys all remember when, if you think back to when you first started driving, the basic pedal structure drove you crazy. You were scared you were going to slam on the accelerator when you mean to brake. Doing the little steering thing with, you weren't going near the radio. That's crazy talk. Okay? After five years, you really can do an awful lot when you drive other than just driving because of massive, massive amounts of repetition. People do this all the time. Every task is like this. Every task is like swimming. If we want to actually become proficient at it, we have to have massive, massive amounts of practice. And it's simply something we don't do in American schools, and so we end up with far slower reading than we, or whatever, mathematics, etc. cetera. Um, for they don't want to do it, I do throw up a fun one here, Mystery Motivator. This is one of my favorite interventions because it was used on me when I was in uh, uh, first grade. My first grade teacher was wicked, wicked good. I mean, she was an incredible teacher. She was about a 600-year-old nun. Um, I'm serious. They live... They live longer than most humans. Uh, there was a footstool there that was pulled to the side and she had to move the footstool. And this was Catholic. We didn't touch the footstool. I mean, you know, you, don't, you didn't touch her stuff. And so she would have to move it and kids that had, had done X amount of things would be able to reach up in it and then she would immediately put it into a bag and they couldn't look at it until they got home. Okay? And she had this like crazy dramatic flair around this that was just I mean, it was amazing. It was just awesome. And I remember getting uh, into it, and, and I remember getting into it like February. It was probably the third week of school or something like that. And I reached in, and of course, being kind of a bad kid, I took a little peek at what I got before I put it in there, because, you know, and, and it was baseball cards. Right? And, and this is the 19th. I mean, I'm jacked. I'm like, I'm going to get, you know, I'm going I'm to get a Johnny Bench. This is going to be awesome. This is baseball cards. Everything. I mean, they were, you know, 
At worst, I get the great gum. So, I mean, I'm, I'm psyched. And I get home, and I pull this out of the bag, and um, the cards, it's, um, uh, they're uh, Saints trading cards. You know what I mean? And I, like, I'm, we're not talking like the New Orleans Saints. I'm talking like, right, like St. Christopher, and it had like key stats on it, right? You know, all kinds of, and it was, it looked just like, you can tell somebody was like, we got to do what, you know, Feeler is doing. We had tops, right? And I'm like, are you kidding? You know, I mean, I'm, I'm in first grade, but I'm like, kidding me. So I walk back in school the, the next day, and she catches my eye, and she's like, what did you think? And she, she knew I wasn't. Okay? And she said, you know, not everything in there is religious. <laughs> and I was hooked. I'm like, oh, my God, there's other stuff in there. I've got to get it. <laughs> and she just she did it with this flair and this drama and this mystery that made it this incredibly effective system. My students always joke with me, I couldn't pull this off for six seconds. I would be like, ah, screw it. They're all, you know, I mean, I just, I wouldn't be able to do the drama aspect of it. I wouldn't be able to buy in. Mystery motivator works because it's a mystery. And if the teacher can't do the mystery, it's a cruddy intervention. But if the teacher's got a little bit of a flair for the dramatic and doesn't mind holding kids in the wind a little bit, it's, it's an incredibly effective system because it doesn't matter what they actually get. It's just the mystery of it that's the interesting deal. That's, I mean, the lottery is, 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 is a very similar you know, framework for it. For kids that work, it's you know, really effective. All right, we get into a series of accuracy ones. Uh, cover copy compared to me is one of the real classic versions of an incredibly effective evidence-based intervention that nobody ever talks about as an evidence-based intervention. Uh, Chris Skinner's got about 45,000 studies on this stuff. Um, published them all in about three different journals. Uh, used to joke that you couldn't open up a new journal without another, you know, do CBM scores correlate with state test and a Skinner article on cover, copy, compare. Um, cover, copy, compare, simple idea of allowing people do, to do independent practice with uh, direct feedback. It can be done in a group fashion. It can be done with math, spelling. Actually, it can be done with reading. It can be done with behavior. There's a number of different ways to do it. Um, and you can do it with groups so that if somebody's having too much difficulty, you can go in and target in uh, direct uh, feedback. Um, what I like about this one, and, and this is going to dip into the next one, is, is I, I, I like cover, copy, compare because it helps people understand that evidence-based interventions don't have to just be pals. They don't have to be pretty little packages that you spend a lot of money on, that you train teachers and have everybody do X, Y, and Z. They can be worksheets. And then if worksheets are done right, with a cover, a copy, compare component, or they can be flashcards. There's this thing called incremental rehearsal, which is one of the most wickedly effective initial direct instruction methodologies out there if you have a few known words. You can train kids to learn Esperanto in incredibly short periods of time by using a seven to one ratio. It's just flashcards. But if you do this in an instrumentized and proceduralized way, that's specific to the evidence-based intervention, they can be incredibly effective targeted evidence-based interventions. They don't cost anything. Teachers have been doing this stuff forever. It's not like some academic came up with incremental rehearsal. Some teacher came up with it and told some other teacher. Academic just stole it and renamed it and, and, and published it in a bunch of journals. Cover, copy, compare being the exact same thing. I like talking to teachers about this because I feel like some of they, they don't believe that their current teaching techniques are evidence-based interventions anymore. And tons of the stuff they do in those classrooms, they are. They just got to think about how they're going to instrumentize them, how they're going to proceduralize them. And with something like cover, copy, compare, or incremental rehearsal, minor alterations to how you do it make it much more effective or, in fact, ineffective. And I think some of those briefs do a, a pretty good job with doing it. Um, all right. I want to hit instructional match and focus on that. We've only got 10 minutes. This, this to me, is one of the biggest issues out there. Um, the brief on this one is a little complicated. It's something that, that I did with uh, Matt Burns. Um, what this brief does is really trains people how to document uh, a child's current instructional level. And it uses modern cut scores rather than some of the stuff people just made up in the 1990s. Um, this idea that if a child is 85% accurate, they're at their instructional level. Or if they're 90% accurate, they're at their instructional level is just stupid. Okay? This, is just, this is just stuff people made up. Okay? Kids start to become, at their instructional level, in the mid-90s. They start to become at the level of where they can do independent practice in the high 90s. We're talking about 97% accurate. Okay? Our general estimates for when a kid is ready to progress to the next level are way too low in schools. 
And I just, if you think about this logically, I don't know how we ever came up with these numbers that 85% was going to be okay or 90% was going to be okay for independent practice. How many of you are NAS members and get your issue of School Psych Review and you're jacked? You're just, you're ready to dive into the articles. You're so excited. Come on. <laughs> Somebody. Right? Why not? I mean, a School Psych Review has done a pretty good job in the last five, ten years of putting articles out there that actually have some nice tools. It's a much more tool-oriented journal than the Journal of School Psych is. It's a really nice journal in providing tools. Why don't you dig? Why don't you get excited? Pop open a bottle of wine, sit out on the back porch, kick up your feet, chill out with a, another article by Matt Burns. You. Okay. Academics are frustrating because we really don't write for you. I mean, I, I don't. I mean, I, most of the time, even when I write practitioner-oriented books, I'm really writing for my friends. Because I want to go from, I'm this, I'm just being honest, I want to go to the conference, I want them to pat me on the back and say, you're so smart. I get some validation, it's like Michael Jordan with Scottie Pippen giving him the sign, you're, you're good, I get a little bit of that, that, it's actually not at all like Michael Jordan or Scottie Pippen because we're not <laughs> rich or famous or whatever, okay, you get the idea. So we make up words for fun. We make up words because, by the way, when you make up words, you're smarter. So I, I call my assessment system, I don't call it daily behavior report cards because people don't understand that. I call it direct behavior ratings, whatever the heck that is, right? And I do that because it makes me look smarter and frankly it increased the publication rates of our articles because it made the other people reading it more academics. So you get to the fifth word and you're like, what are they talking about? You get to the eighth word and you're like, what are they talking about? Or maybe you get to the 97th word and you're like, what are they talking about? You are reading in those journals with a 1% or 2% error rate and it drives you nuts. It drives you insane that you don't know what those words are. It drives you insane that you would actually have to think about the words for a second. Because that's not how we are with reading. I put down plenty of books because you know what? The writing's too difficult and I have to think. And I, look, I'm not pleasure reading and thinking. I'm not, I'm not gonna do it, okay? No, I mean, I have to think on my job, kind of. So I mean, I really don't wanna do it on my free time. I want something, you know, why do we ask kids to read with 5% error rates and ask, act like they're ready to be independent? We don't do it. Why would we expect they would do it with 5 10% error rates? That's an incredibly frustrating experience that kids go through. When we have an instructional match problem, there is only one solution. There is only one intervention that's going to be effective. You've got to put a book in front of them that they can read. That's it. And by read, I mean read almost perfectly. Now, I love these. We get these episodes on getting spunk in kids and challenging kids. That's all cool if you're directly working with them at that moment in time. But the minute you allow any independent work, it should be almost airless. Again, this is nothing new. We've understood the principles of airless learning for 50 years. Well, we've understood the principles of airless learning for longer than that. We've had a science base for 50 years. In schools, it's never going to work if you don't have instructional match for these kids. And School Psych Review will be one of the most distributed, but not as much read journals, as long as we write for academics and don't write for practitioners. Now, that might be okay. I mean, that's, that's going to keep happening. But with these kids, the instructional match issue has got to be far better understood. I'm stunned how many times I present to teachers and teach them instructional match material, and it's like the first time they've ever heard it. And I mean in terms of actual percentages, actual raw numbers. This isn't something they teach in regular ed. This isn't something that they teach people to really have a fundamental understanding. The briefs on this are kind of complex. They're kind of problematic. But I, I think some of the more valuable ones to get real percentages, they're going to get kids who enjoy working with the material rather than be really frustrated by it. Um, i got a couple of minutes left, but no, not really. But um, uh, there, there's a lot of places to find these interventions. Um, I like Natalie Rathbun's book, but again, it's actually... Um, it's done by subject, not by function, and so you're going to have to do a functional uh, translation of it, which I think is kind of hard to do in some instances. Um, one of the things, and my, one of my colleagues, my primary colleague and I wrote an article a long time ago, I, I do think we should be focusing much more on initial strategies on what teachers already do. 
I'm amazed how often teachers are doing evidence-based interventions with another kid, <laughs> or, they're, or they're doing something with the kid, but if you change X, Y, and Z, more instructional match, more repetition, more dosage, et cetera, it becomes effective. The nice things about interventions that they're currently doing in their environment is that they're doing them in their environment. They obviously like those because they're doing those. All right? And so I think we need to spend a lot more time thinking about core function, thinking about what we want to accomplish, and then allowing ourselves to build evidence-based interventions or to manipulate evidence-based interventions that the teachers want to do, rather than saying, hey, I've got PALS, and this is, I mean, I love PALS, by the way. This is a fantastic tier two approach. But, but having that be your go-to if the teacher's doing something that does that, they've got a partner reading process that they already do in their class, but they're just doing the matching wrong with two kids. You know, I, I think that's an approach we really got to think of. Um, on the site, we've got some neat problem-solving materials that we've been recently working on. I've got a one-page form that I use with a lot of schools. Um, I keep it to one page because I find that if you have a two-page form in the problem-solving meeting, A, the meeting lasts four and a half hours, and B, nobody actually fills out the second page. Um, the whole point of this is trying to get at these questions um, and trying to force people through it. People can play with it. If you've got any suggestions on the form, we're always playing with it and changing it. That's the second page with it. Um, well, last piece, and then I'll stop. Um, we talk a lot in RTI about some base conversations. Um, the piece of function, to me, has a huge implication on the issue of non-responder. Um, if we treat EBI as, as things that are universally effective, any time they don't work, we blame the child. We go right back to the model that we've used for, for 30, 40 years. Any error hits child. If we assume that evidence-based interventions require function and integrity, then we understand that our initial demonstrations of a non-responder have to be considered poor functional match or poor integrity presentation. Right? Now, what this means to me is that we should invest very little time and energy in the first intervention. And I think this is hard for us to do as school psychologists. Our eight hours of testing and our one hour of report writing and our one hour meeting were all based on building the right plan for the child. A lot of upfront time to build the perfect plan. And unfortunately, with this presentation, we should spend about 30 seconds on our first model Try the bad boy out, see if it works. If it does, awesome. If not, punt. Right? And I think that's a hard flip for everyone in the school. I think it's hard for people not to try to come up with the right intervention. But understanding the nuances of evidence-based intervention, that's just an illogical approach. The only way we can deal with this is mass repetition through a much, much more dynamic approach rather than trying to get it right the first time around. There's just no, there's no way we're actually going to do that. So.